look at what things have become now, there's no word for it. Each time something else strange happens, everyone knows who's to blame. The details might change, but the style is the same. Chaos Legion, bringing Hogwarts to the brink of disruption. Bright the sun, bright the air, bright the students, and bright their parents. Clean the paved ground of Platform 9.75, the winter sun hanging low in the sky at 9.45 a.m. in the morning on January 5th, 1992. And the boy who lived was back. He couldn't help thinking of the parents he'd only just kissed goodbye, of the world whose problems he was leaving behind. Harry yawned and stretched, feeling more lethargic than anything else at the conclusion of his vacation. He didn't feel like reading his textbooks or even any serious science fiction. This morning, what he needed was something completely frivolous to occupy his attention. Well, that wouldn't be hard to come by if he was willing to part with four knuts. Besides, if the Daily Prophet was corrupt and the Quibbler was the only competing newspaper, there might be some suppressed real news in there. The vendor started to smile as Harry approached, and then the man's face suddenly changed as he caught sight of the scar. Harry Potter? No, Mr. Durian, just an amazing imitation. And then Harry's voice stopped in his throat as he caught sight of the top fold of the quibbler. Sloshed Seer spills secrets. Dark Lord to return. For just an instant, Harry tried to clamp down on his face, before realizing that not being shocked could be just as revealing, in a sense. Excuse me. His voice sounded a little alarmed, and he didn't even know whether that was too revealing or just what his normal reaction would be if he didn't know anything. He'd spent too much time around Slytherins. He was forgetting how to keep secrets from ordinary people. Four knuts hit the counter. One copy of the Quibbler, please. Oh, no worries, Mr. Potter. It's... never mind, just... The newspaper flew through the air and hit Harry's fingers, and he unfolded it. Sloshed Seer Spill Secrets. Dark Lord to Return, Wed Draco Malfoy. It's free. For you, I mean. No, I was going to buy one anyway. The vendor took the coins, and Harry read on. Gosh, you get a seer smashed on six slugs of scotch, and she spills all sorts of secret stuff. I mean, who'd have thought that Sirius Black and Peter Pettigrew were secretly the same person? Not me. They've even got a picture of the two of them together, so we know who it is that's secretly the same person. Yup. Pretty clever disguise, isn't it? And I'm secretly 65 years old. You don't look half that. And I'm betrothed to Hermione Granger, and Bellatrix Black, and Luna Lovegood, and, oh yes, Draco Malfoy too. Going to be one interesting wedding. You know, I heard at first that Luna Lovegood was insane, and I wondered if she really was, or if she was just making stuff up and giggling to herself the whole time. Then, when I read my second Quibbler headline, I decided that she couldn't be insane. I mean, it can't be easy to make the stuff up, you couldn't do it by accident. And now do you know what I think? I think she must be mad after all. When ordinary people try to make stuff up, it doesn't come out like this. Something's got to go really wrong with the inside of your head before this is what comes out when you start making stuff up. The vendor stared at Harry. Seriously, who reads this stuff? You. Harry wandered off to read his newspaper. He didn't sit at the same nearby table he'd sat down at with Draco the first time he'd prepared to board this train. That seemed like tempting history to repeat itself. It wasn't just that his first week at Hogwarts had been, judging by the quibbler, 54 years long. It was that, in Harry's humble opinion, his life did not need any new threads of complexity. So Harry found a small iron chair somewhere else, distant from the main crowd and the occasional muffled cracks of parents apparating in with their children, and sat down and read the quibbler to see if it contained any suppressed news. And besides the obvious craziness, heaven help them all if any of that was real, there was a good deal of snide romantic gossip, but nothing that would really be all that important if it was true.
Harry was just reading about the ministry's proposed marriage law to ban all marriages when... Harry Potter, said a silken voice that sent a shock of adrenaline jolting through Harry's blood. Harry looked up. Lucius Malfoy. His face was expressionless. Two men flanked him, the senior Crab and Goyle, and Harry thought he could guess which was which, but then it didn't really matter. They were merely Lucius's appendages, as certain as if they'd been the two rightmost toes on his left foot. Next time, he was going to do the smart thing and wait outside in the muggle part of King's Cross until 10.55 a.m. I apologize for disturbing you, Mr. Potter, but you have answered none of my owls, and this, I thought, might be my only opportunity to meet with you. I have received none of your owls. Dumbledore intercepted them, I presume, but I would not have answered them if I had, except through Draco. For me to deal with you directly, without Draco's knowledge, would trespass on our friendship. Please go away. Please go away. Is that your pose, then? Well, I shall play along a little. What was your purpose in maneuvering your good friend, my son, into a public alliance with that girl? Oh, that's obvious, right? Draco's working with Granger will make him realize that Muggleborns are human after all. Bwah, ha, ha. Yes, that does sound like one of Dumbledore's plans. Which it is not. Indeed. It is part of my game with Draco and no work of Dumbledore's, and that is all I will say. Let us dispense with games. If my suspicions are true, you would hardly do Dumbledore's bidding in any case, Mr. Potter. There was a slight pause. So you know. Tell me, at which point, exactly, did you realize? When I read your response to Professor Quirrell's little speech. I was puzzled at first, for it seemed not in your own interest. It took me days to understand whose interest was being served, and then it all finally became clear. And it is also obvious that you are weak, in some ways, if not others. Very clever of you, but perhaps you mistake my interests. Perhaps I do. Indeed, that is precisely what I fear. You are playing strange games with my son, to a purpose I cannot guess. That is not a friendly act, and you cannot but expect me to be concerned. Some instinct within Harry claimed that it would be a very bad idea to show his fear, to let Lucia see that he could be intimidated. They were in a public train station anyway. I find it interesting that you think I could benefit from doing Draco harm. But it is irrelevant, Lucius. He is my friend, and I do not betray my friends. What? His face showed sheer shock. Then... Company! Neville was approaching, looking scared but determined, in tow behind a tall woman who didn't look scared at all. Madam Longbottom. Mr. Malfoy, are you being an annoyance to our Harry Potter? Oh, I rather think not. Come to protect him from me, have you? And this would be Mr. Potter's loyal lieutenant, the last scion of Longbottom, Neville, self-styled of chaos. How strangely does the world turn. Sometimes I think it must all be mad. Harry had no idea what to say to that, and Neville looked confused and frightened. I doubt it is the world that is mad. You seem in a poor mood, Mr. Malfoy. Did the speech of our dear Professor Quirrell cost you a few allies? It was a clever enough slander of my abilities, though only effective upon the fools who believe that I was truly a Death Eater. What? I was under the Imperious, young man. The Dark Lord could hardly have begun recruiting among pure-blood families without the support of House Malfoy. I demurred, and he simply made sure of me. His own Death Eaters did not know it until afterward, hence the false mark I bear. Though since I did not truly consent, it does not bind me. Some of the Death Eaters still believe I was foremost among their number, and for the peace of this nation I let them believe it to keep them controlled. 
but I was not such a fool as to support that ill-fated adventurer of my own choice. Ignore him. He must spend the rest of his life pretending for fear of your testimony under Veritas Serum. Lucius turned his back on her dismissively and faced Harry again. Will you request this Harridan to depart, Mr. Potter? I think not. I prefer to deal with the part of House Malfoy that's my own age. There was a long pause then. The gray eyes searched him. Of course. I do feel the fool now. This whole time, you were just pretending to have no idea what we were talking about. Harry met the gaze and said nothing. My son is my heart. The last worthwhile thing I have in this world. And I say to you, in a spirit of friendship, if he were to come to harm, I would give my life over to vengeance. But so long as my son does not come to harm, I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors. And as you have asked nothing more of me, I will ask nothing more of you. Lucius's dark robe swirled around him and his white hair as he turned to the senior Goyle. We return to Malfoy Manor. Then there were three pops of apparition, and they were gone. A silence followed. Dear heavens, what was that about? Harry shrugged helplessly. Then he looked at Neville. There was sweat on Neville's forehead. Thank you very much, Neville. Your help was greatly appreciated, Neville. Yes, General. You have wrought many changes in my grandson. I approve of some, but not others. Send me a list of which is which. I'll see what I can do. I shall, young man. Thank you. Mr. Potter, the speech given by Professor Quirrell is something our nation long needed to hear. I cannot say as much of your comment on it. I'll take your opinion under advisement. I dearly hope that you do, said Madame Longbottom and turned back to her grandson. Do I still need to... It's okay for you to go, Grandma. I'll be fine on my own this time. Now that I approve of, she said, and popped and vanished like a soap bubble. You're going to try to fix all the changes she approves of, right? Not all of them. I just want to make sure I'm not corrupting you. Draco looked very worried. His head kept darting around, despite the fact that he had insisted on them going down into Harry's trunk and using a true quieting charm and not just the sound-blurring barrier. What did you say to father? I... Look, can you tell me what he said to you before he dropped you off? That I should tell him right away if you seem to be threatening me. That I should tell him right away if there was anything I was doing that could pose a threat to you. Father thinks you're dangerous, Harry. Whatever you said to him today, it scared him. It's not a good idea to scare father. Oh, hell. What did you talk about? Harry leaned back wearily in the small folding chair that sat at the bottom of his trunk's cavern. You know, Draco, just as the fundamental question of rationality is, what do I think I know and how do I think I know it? There is also a cardinal sin, a way of thinking that's the opposite of that. Like the ancient Greek philosophers, they had no clue what was going on, so they'd go around saying things like, all is water, or all is fire, and they never ask themselves, wait a minute, even if everything is water, how could I possibly know that? They didn't ask themselves if they had evidence which discriminated that possibility from all the other possibilities you could imagine. Evidence they'd be very unlikely to encounter if that theory wasn't true. Harry, what did you talk about with father? I don't know, actually. So it's very important that I not just make stuff up. Harry had never heard Draco shriek in horror in quite that high a pitch before.